Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and I'm joined by Sheldon Richmond, the foundation's vice president. This is the Libertarian Angle. The burning issues that we're going to discuss today are the failed rescue attempt in Yemen on the part of the U.S. military to save two hostages that were being held at by Al the Al-Qaeda chapter of Arabia. And then uh, we're going to go into the police uh, situation here in this country, the increased militarization of the police, the, the, the killing of, of Eric Garner, the, what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, just the overall uh, analysis of what's going on with, uh, with the police forces and, and really how it relates to the, uh, to the military side of the U.S. government here and the, the effect that, that, that how they're, they're integrating with each other. But let's start with the uh, the rescue attempt, Sheldon. It seems to me that this is just classic imperial conduct that's costing the lives of more people. Uh, I mean, this is what's going on before even 9-11, where the U.S. has been intervening in the Middle East uh, for decades, uh, been doing some horrific things of sanctions against Iraq that killed all those Iraqi children. Uh, the official spokesman of the United States and the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, telling the world that half a million deaths of Iraqi children were worth it. And by that, she meant the worth the attempt to get rid of uh, the U.S. government's former partner and ally, Saddam Hussein. Uh, and so you've got this, this what Chalmers Johnson, the, the noted uh, former CIA analyst who's written these great books, what he called blowback, uh, the, the, the repercussions from, from all this U.S. interventionism. And uh, it seems to me that this 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 uh, failed rescue attempt, where both men, uh, an American named Luke Summer and a South African named Pierre Corky, were killed, is just another reflection of what's going on. That the perversity of U.S. foreign policy, that that these groups in the Middle East take um, innocent Americans custody in anger and retaliation for U.S. interventionism. Then U.S. intervention comes in to try to save them, cost them their lives. When does this finally stop, Sheldon? Well, you're, you're, you're correct in referring to the wider context. Uh, in the more particular context of Yemen, the, the U.S. has been conducting a uh, sort of out-of-the-headlines, uh, so-called low-level war, uh, really since uh, – uh, 2001, uh, with many, many drone attacks, civilian casualties. At first, the, US, uh, the uh, Yemeni government tried to keep it secret that the U.S. was conducting uh, these and, and actually was claiming that it was doing this, uh, but uh, then eventually became clear that it was the, <coughs> it was the U.S. government doing it. Uh, they've been often going against uh, uh, the Yemen government's uh, own enemies, whether they were you know, terrorists that, pr that produced or, or presented any wider threat, uh, you know, we, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I suppose there's al-Qaeda operating in, uh, in the lower Arabian Peninsula. But again, all that's the result of the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, to begin with. I mean, after all, there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq until the U.S. Uh, invaded and overthrew uh, Saddam Hussein's government, and, and which, you know, just helped to spread al-Qaeda uh, all around the region. So, like you say, it's an outgrowth of, of U.S. policy. Uh, you know, I condemn anybody seizing photojournalists or aid workers or teachers. Uh, that's obviously a terrible thing to do. They're non-combatants. Uh, they should be left alone. And so uh, there's no way do we want to uh, <clears throat> uh, rationalize what uh, these individuals in this organization uh, have done. But uh, we have to put it in the larger context to understand uh, why it happens. And we, we, we know why it happens. There's plenty of uh, work done on this, but the University of Chicago and Robert Pape's uh, project about how uh, terrorism and particularly suicide bombing, which wasn't the case uh, in this particular instance, uh, is directly tied to occupation and, uh, and, and warfare by outsiders. And while the U.S. has not formally occupied uh, Yemen, uh, I imagine there's special ops in Yemen, but uh, it's been conducting this war from the air, from uh, by drones. And since when you use drones, you're not presenting a uh, threat or danger to uh, American personnel. You know, most people don't care about it, right? Their sons are not over there. Their sons and daughters are not over there uh, fighting, so people don't need to care. Instead, they're in some remote location operating a game console and dropping deadly, uh, you know, uh, missiles on people that we may or may not be bad people. I mean, we don't we don't even know. The U.S. Uh, has defined military uh, military person as basically a male of a, of a certain age. 
And then after the fact, if you can present proof that this person was not a guerrilla of some kind, they'll posthumously clear you. But that doesn't bring you back to life. I don't know if the people in the Pentagon and the White House know that. But they're still conducting their Tuesday morning kill raids and kill lists, I guess, where Obama personally selects the victims who are going to be killed that week. This is outrageous. We shouldn't be surprised that Westerners get seized. It's a shame that these are innocent Westerners, but there's no mystery here, and we could stop it. Yeah, and it's not just Westerners. I mean, it's Americans and people that belong to countries that support the U.S. and imperialism and interventionism. I mean, one of the noteworthy aspects of all this is that Swiss citizens are never kidnapped. They're never killed. They're never harassed or abused by al Qaeda or anybody else in the Middle East. They leave the Swiss alone. Now, why is that? Well, the answer is obvious. The Swiss government is devoted to defense. It's exclusively devoted to defense. It doesn't go abroad with bombs and missiles. It's not in the Middle East. It didn't join the coalitions of the willing and all this. It just minds its own business. It essentially has a foreign policy that was modeled after the founding foreign policy of the United States. That was manifested in John Quincy Adams' famous Fourth of July address in 1821, where he says, this country does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Well, it does now. And it has ever since, at the very minimum, since the advent of the national security state after World War II. I mean, this is its mission to go into the Middle East and support dictators, partner with dictators like they're doing in Egypt right now. That's their partner, that dictator there. And they partnered with Saddam Hussein. But then all of a sudden they turn on dictators or dictators that don't follow the official line or speak up in favor of the U.S. government on whatever it's doing. They go after those dictators. And in the process, they bomb innocent people. They kill innocent people. I mean, look at the people they've killed in Iraq. We don't know the exact number because the Pentagon early on said they're not worth keeping track of. We're only going to keep track of American troops. But one thing's for sure. No Iraqi citizen had anything to do with 9-11. Nothing. So this was a pure war of aggression. And it was justified by saying, well, but we're going after Saddam. The world will be better without Saddam Hussein. I'm not sure very many Iraqis today would agree with that. And I think if the dead could talk, the dead would not agree with it. And they've been estimated to be at least 100,000 dead people. Well, you know, all of this creates anger and animosity, not against Switzerland, which had nothing to do with it, but against Americans and against countries that have regimes that followed the line of the American government, supported the American government in all this imperialist interventionist activity. And so as you and I have pointed out for how many years now, this is a perpetual terrorist producing machine because the more people they kill, with every person they kill, they generate 10 new people that are now wanting they would now want revenge. And so you've got it's the perfect racket. And so that even in this raid is where they're going to say these two these two guys, the probability is they kill some innocent people there, too. And as you point out, the militants in sometimes are just there defending, defending the Middle East or defending the country from an illegal occupier occupier. I mean, that's no different, Sheldon, with what Americans would do, at least some Americans. If we were being illegally occupied by, say, some Middle Eastern country or by China, there'd be American men and women taking up arms against the occupier. And so this is what's this is what's going on. They say that they're making the world safe for Americans. How is this making the world safe for Americans? Americans can't even travel abroad now without being taken captive and kidnapped and beheaded, all as a result of what the U.S. government in this empire has been doing. Yeah, we should point out that the civilians are dying in Syria and Iraq under the U.S. NATO bombings there. The U.S. government's not interested in counting them, but there are reports, and while the numbers are hard to ascertain, we know that civilians are dying in Syria and Iraq through drones and airstrikes. And there are drones in Afghanistan as well, where surely civilians are dying. 
the interesting thing is that in Syria and Iraq, with the, this uh, new war on uh, the Islamic State, uh, the Obama administration has announced that the standard that they use elsewhere, like in Afghanistan or Pakistan or, or Yemen, where they uh, they claim that they, they try to make sure the person targeted is actually a bad person, even that standard is not being applied in Iraq and Syria, and they've announced that. So it, it's not much of a standard, but even that is not being used in the new war against uh, the Islamic State. So the chances are uh, lots of civilians are, are getting killed. Uh, first of all, uh, the Islamic State is in a lot of urban areas, and so there's no way you can be hitting them without also hitting uh, innocent people. And, of course, the fact that the Islamic State is even in control of a large portion of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, eastern uh, Syria and western Iraq is the result of <clears throat> two things. Well, a lot of things, actually, but the two, if we pick the two big ones, the invasion of Iraq in, 19, in 2003 by uh, George uh, W. Bush, and then the uh, Obama-Clinton policy of declaring Assad an illegitimate ruler, which was simply an invitation to jihadists to come into uh, Syria <clears throat> and, uh, and attempt to overthrow him, because now the, the, the whole uh, uh, power of the West, you know, the, the, sort of the bully pulpit of the West had declared, had branded Assad as someone who must leave, and that was a magnet for jihadis, both uh, Syrian, Iraqi, and probably other from other places. Uh, to come in and, um, and take advantage of that situation. And uh, the, the U.S. has now ended up with this very confused uh, uh, policy where, where they're, they're fighting Assad's enemies, but they also claim that, they're, that the U.S. is Assad's enemy. But, you're help, but they're helping them by going after the Islamic State. And I uh, noticed in the paper of the weekend that it, the, the U.S. has actually praised Iran now for airstrikes in, in Iraq. Uh, in it, you, you can't uh, make this stuff up. Uh, every day is something uh, new and bewildering. Uh, uh, that wasn't long ago where they said, we don't want Iran involved in Iraq. It's their next-door neighbor in Iraq and wants to attack them. So let's, and the U.S. helped put in a pro-Iranian uh, government in Iraq. So you know, you can, I'll leave, let people figure that one out. Uh, but they, they warned Iran you know, not, not to <laughs> get involved in Iraq. Uh, they, they said they'd never cooperate with their, uh, Iran over, over Iraq, even though they supposedly now on paper have a common enemy, the Islamic State. And yet over the weekend, I think it was Curry praising uh, Iran for, uh, for a strike. So, you know, even if you have a scorecard, it's hard to keep up. Well, it really goes to show how sick and perverse the whole thing is. Uh, I mean, the whole concept of foreign interventionism and foreign empire and foreign military bases. I mean, let's face it. The U.S. is responsible for all this chaos and crisis in, in Syria, uh, encouraging these uprisings the way they do in other parts. I remember them doing it against their former partner and ally, Saddam Hussein. Uh, at the end of the first war, the Persian Gulf War, they incited the, the Shiites to go over there and overthrow them and put in a U.S. <laughs> dictator here. And as Saddam was massacring them, U.S. forces just stood by and watched. Uh, I mean, it was just another perverse aspect of U.S. foreign policy. You know, people are pawns. This is not about freedom and it's not about democracy. This is about hegemony. This is about power and control. Uh, I mean, consider Syria. You know, they, they tell us, oh, well, uh, Assad is this horrible dictator. He needs to, to, to be ousted from power the same way they were talking about, you know, the, Iraq and now Iran. But what they forget and what the mainstream press, unfortunately, forgets is that Assad, just not too long before that, was their partner and ally in the war on terrorism. Remember when the CIA kidnapped that guy from Canada, Mehar Arar, and uh, they intercepted him on a flight back home to Canada uh, at Dulles Airport. They, they kidnapped him, took him into custody, and then they, quote, deported him to Syria because he had dual citizenship. And... Lo and behold, uh, they, they somehow make a deal. We still don't know how they negotiated this deal, and the mainstream press has never demanded to know how they struck the deal. But somehow or another, the CIA, with its counterparts with Assad, uh, struck a deal that, that ARAR would be turned over to them and tortured. And he was. The, the Syrians acting on behalf of the, of the CIA, the U.S. government, tortured this guy for a year trying to get a confession from him. And finally, at the end of the year, even the Syrians said, we don't have anything on the guy. <laughs> He's innocent. And so they release him. 
And, uh, of course, does the CIA or the U.S. government uh, apologize? Of course not. They treat uh, ARAR like he's still this criminal. Uh, but what, well, what I found fascinating was it's, that Assad was their partner. And then shortly after that, they turn on him and say, oh, well, now it's time to oust him. I mean, the whole thing is just absolutely perverse. We've, we've, we've gone through this for decades uh, with, with interventionism. I remember right after 9-11, I wrote this, this parable, uh, this fable of the, of the hornets, where, you know, there, there was this cop uh, in this little village that was going out poking a big hornet's nest in, in the village. And the hornets uh, were coming into the village and attacking the, the, uh, uh, the populace. And everybody says, we got to go to war against the hornets and stuff. And this little boy pipes up and says, why don't we just stop, um, you know, poking the hornet's nest? And everybody's outraged, you know, that this kid would, would tell the truth like that. But that's really what's happened. And then I pointed out in the fable that, okay, they go and destroy the big hornet's nest, but all of a sudden all these little hornet's nests start appearing all over the forest. And that's exactly what's been happening here. I mean, they, you know, they, they invade Afghanistan in retaliation for 9-11. They invade Iraq in retaliation for 9-11. 9-11 came about because of their prior interventions. And now we've got al-Qaeda in Iraq, al-Qaeda in Yemen, al-Qaeda here, al-Qaeda there. It's a never-ending uh, process. It is, it is a crooked, corrupt process because guess who makes all the money on this? The U.S. Um, what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. The contractors are in high cotton the longer this thing goes on. So let's, let's, let's move on to the other ones, a little bit related here, the militarization of the cops, because, you know, let's face it, when you live in a militarized society, which we have since at least the 1950s with the national security state, you know, we glorify the flyovers and stuff at, at, um, at sporting events, much like the Soviet people used to glorify the tanks that were going through the parades and stuff. I mean, when you've got this kind of society where you're killing people on a constant basis and, and it, it, we never see the pictures of the dead in the newspapers, it's, it's almost a surreal deal where your, your government's just killing people constantly on a, on a daily basis. How is this not going to seep into, into society generally? And we see this with the, uh, the militarization of the police. And uh, we, we see the constant harassment and abuse that the cops act like soldiers, like sergeants. They, they, they look at civilians as the privates, and they're the sergeants, and they expect their orders to be obeyed. And Sheldon, they're killing with people with impunity, just like the troops overseas are killing people with impunity. Yeah, I, I'd say it a little more strongly. I don't think they look at the people as uh, privates in the Army. I think they look at them as the, the, the uh, inhabitants of an occupied territory. And you better uh, do what they say or else. I really think here's what happened in the case, the, the chokehold uh, death of Eric Gardner, who uh, was accused. Of course, uh, there's been no trial, obviously, because he's dead, or proof that he was selling uh, untaxed cigarettes. We can talk about that in a second, uh, as if that's some terrible crime against the state. Uh, I don't think they intended to kill the guy. And while race uh, probably uh, had some uh, uh, influence on this incident. I can picture the same thing having ha being ha happening to a, uh, a a white guy who was, uh, say, a low, lower lower uh, class. I mean, I think there's some, as much class as, as involved here as, as race. Uh, I think what they intended to do not was not to kill him, but to show him who's boss in a way that he would never forget. And as someone responded to me on Facebook when I put up that line, well, in fact, they showed him in a way he'll never remember because uh, they killed him. But I think that was really what was going on. We'll show you who's boss. When we say you're under arrest and do what we say, we want obedience, no matter what the reason is, no matter what. Now, let's look at the reason. They claimed he was uh, selling so-called Lucy's, uh, which means individual or less than a pack of cigarettes uh, that, w that were uh, allegedly brought in from North Carolina where the taxes are much lower and sold on the street of New York City where the taxes are very high. A pack of cigarettes costs like 12 or 13 bucks. Uh, roughly half of that or so is, uh, is tax, state and, and federal and probably city. There's probably some city tax in there. Uh, the, the, the numbers show that uh, cigarette smuggling uh, is uh, highest in New York because of the, of the taxation, especially in New York City. And every time the tax goes up, you'll find stories in the paper about, about smuggling. Now, just to put this in a little bit of context, there was a time in the United, in the United States with the colonies when the smuggler was the hero and the customs agent who was looking for the smuggler was the villain who'd get uh, tarred and feathered or, or ridden out of town on a rail. He wasn't a popular person. 
smuggler was regarded as, uh, uh, to hark back to uh, Walter Block's book, uh, um, uh, Defending the Undefendable, the, the, the smuggler was a hero because he was bringing goods that people wanted, that the government was, uh, you know, standing in the way of uh, obtaining. Uh, so uh, uh, Garner was on the street, if he was. I mean, he'd been arrested in the past for selling loose cigarettes, so even to just assume he was doing it, was offering cigarettes to people who, uh, low-income people most likely, who would have a very tough time spending 12 or $13 on a pack of cigarettes. So he was actually performing a social service. He should be praised. He should have been praised for this. Instead, he was harassed by the police, eventually, you know, taken down by, what, five or six people, uh, one, one who had his hand around his neck and one mashed his face into the cement, and he was a big guy. Uh, uh, they, in order to show him this lesson, right, teach him this lesson that you don't ever talk back to the – not that he talked back. He just put his hands up and said, what are you guys bothering me for? I didn't do anything. You keep doing this to me. That, that's considered talking back. Um, they knew that he was a big guy, and they showed utter reckless disregard for his life. Because what was most important here was teaching him the lesson he'd never forget, namely that you shut up and do what we say. We're the boss on this street. You're the occupied, you know, the resident of the occupied territory. So shut up and do what we say. That's what this is all about. I firmly believe. I agree with you. And, um, you know, if, 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 if he had been trying to defend himself and grabbed uh, one of the cops around mm -hmm. the, the neck and accidentally killed a cop, I guarantee you they would have a grand jury indictment against him in about three minutes for murder, even if he said it was by accident. Uh, but when the cops do it to a citizen, boy, the grand juries just say, oh, you know, the grand juries are sort of the select group. It's, it's, it's not chosen by random. And uh, there's just no doubt that the, that the grand jury looks at cops differently than they do citizens. And when I watch this video, I mean, I, I'm like everybody else. I, I just couldn't believe it. I just grimaced. And and you're right. He wasn't talking back, but he was raising his voice. You see, and, and, and that's disrespect. And and to a cop who looks at himself as the master, and we're the serf. You know, it used to be where the citizens are the bosses. We pay their salaries. And, and they're the public servants. Well, you know, you walk in any household that has servants, you don't see the servants talking back. To the, to the head of the household. You don't see him screaming at him or yelling at him because they'll be fired. That's not the situation anymore in America. The cops see themselves as the masters, and effectively they are the masters. We're the serfs. This is a serfdom society. And it starts at the federal level with the Internal Revenue Service, the whole income tax, where they, they essentially give us an allowance, allow us to keep a certain amount of our money. Uh, it was never like that in early America where you, you didn't uh, you didn't have an income tax. And that attitude of master and serf at the federal level that now exists, the drug war, they put us in jail for ingesting substances that they don't approve of, uh, that's master and serf. That is not a sovereign citizen. And uh, it seeps down to the local level. Uh, yeah, I look at it as a master and a private, but you're right. It's, it's just a, it's a master, uh, I mean, a sergeant and a private, but this is a master and a serf. They're the boss. And this guy talked back to him. He raised his voice to him, and they didn't like it. You don't talk like that to your bosses was their attitude. And uh, they take him down. They didn't care whether he was saying, I can't, can't breathe or not. They couldn't care less. He's, he's just this, this nothing to them. He is absolutely not. He, he, in their eyes, is the way the U.S. government views all these people that they're killing overseas. They're nothing. They don't count. This is why they didn't count them when they were dying in Iraq, when they were killing in Iraq, when they were torturing them at Abu Ghraib. People who had nothing to do with 9-11, who had never attacked the United States, they didn't care. That's the way the cops felt about Eric Garner. They don't care. Okay, so he dies. It's just one other black guy. You know, there are plenty of other black people in America. That's their attitude. They don't care. And uh, that's what, what we libertarians have to keep fighting back on, that human life does matter. It matters even when people are considered guilty, it matters. That's why we have trials. That's why we stand for due process of law, that before you're going to go and assassinate somebody overseas, including an American or a foreigner, you bring them to trial. You prove they're guilty before you kill them. That doesn't work anymore, not in foreign affairs. And that mindset's the same here. So they kill this black guy. And what's he doing? Selling 
individual cigarettes. That's phenomenal to me. I mean, this is where the big war on poverty and, and the great society has brought us, where a guy has six kids trying to raise a family, and he's harassed and abused by these cops because he's trying to support his family by selling individual cigarettes. I wonder how much he could get for each cigarette. I mean, what, a couple of bucks at most or a dollar or something? And, and, and they can't leave this guy alone. To me, Sheldon, this is the ultimate horror of the whole welfare warfare state. It, it, his cry of leave me alone, you're suffocating me, is really the cry that libertarians have on the whole welfare warfare state. Leave us alone. Ditch your stupid drug wars. Uh, ditch your foreign policy. Ditch your national security state. Ditch your income tax and your IRS. Leave us alone. And that was the cry in the, in the Declaration of Independence, too, when the Founding Fathers said, they, this government, our government, the British government, has sent swarms of bureaucrats across our land that are eating out our substance and harassing us. That's where we come in this country, where the cops and other bureaucrats, and that's what they are, bureaucrats, are eating out our substance, harassing us, and just won't leave us alone, whether it's ingesting the drugs, working as a hairdresser without a license, or selling untaxed cigarettes. Well, I'm supposed to hear you say you don't understand why they regarded this as so serious. He was doing about as serious a thing as you can do. It doesn't get any worse than this. He was depriving the government of revenue. Uh, and without that revenue, how's it going to help the poor? So uh, he was doing something very serious. He was sell he was uh, selling <laughs> cigarettes that wouldn't lead to tax money going into the government's coffers. Uh, I heard some commentators say that uh, uh, the uh, the retailers along that street who, who are licensed to sell cigarettes uh, had complained about him before. I don't know if that's true or not, but but it may well be true. Sure, there's collusion between the re the licensed retailers who sell cigarettes for 12 or 13 dollars a pack and, and remit the taxes to uh, to the state there's, a, there's collusion between those retailers and the state to qu to quash independent entrepreneurs who are offering a uh, you know the good uh, for a lower price because they've managed to evade the tax collector again that used to be an honorable uh, uh, activity uh, in early america uh, but it's uh, apparently honorable uh, no more uh, so uh, so uh, you need to keep in mind that he was committing a very serious crime in the eyes of the state, depriving it of revenue. I mean, come on, it's the lifeblood. Uh, you know, and, and there's another, there's an institutional point to be made here about the grand jury, uh, and it illustrates a, a principle that uh, Murray Rothbard long enunciated. Uh, you know, the grand jury began in England as a, uh, as a way to, uh, to check uh, the power of the, um, of the state's prosecutor by making sure they weren't trumping up cases against people. So this was a group of citizens who would say, no, we're not going to indict you. But it, it morphed, uh, I don't know how soon, but it morphed into simply a tool of the prosecutor to give him cover so he can have an indictment when he wants one. Uh, but if he doesn't want an indictment, he can make sure uh, he doesn't get one. There's an old saying, and it's attributed to some famous uh, attorney, I forget who it is, that uh, you know, a prosecutor could have a ham sandwich indicted if he wanted to. Uh, and it's become a cliche, but it's true. The, the, the prosecutor, there's no, there's no judge in a, in a grand jury proceeding, as you know. There's no, uh, and nobody's representing the, uh, uh, the so-called defendant, uh, except in the case of police, where the prosecutor is also a representative of the defendant. That's where the interesting thing happens. He's now on both sides of the street, right? He's the prosecutor uh, uh, officially. But his sympathies are going to be with the police. He's working with the police every day. He's part of that system. So he's really playing both sides. And, and, and therefore, he can present to the grand jury exactly what he wants to either get or not get an indictment. And so the Rothbard principle is that uh, uh, every principle that was, uh, that was generated to put limits on government, ostensibly at least intended to, to limit government, has quickly turned into a way to expand government power. So the divine right of kings used to say, well, the king can only, you can only do God's will. And that sounded like a limit, except he then became the interpreter of God's will. So he now, got, he now had the sanction of God for anything he wants to do. Or democratic representation used to be that that was going to be the limit. You can only do what the people want. But then what happened was the government said, yes, we represent the people. Therefore, we speak in the name of the people. And so anything we do has the sanction of the fact that we are the people's representatives. So one after another of these principles that was designed, that was apparently designed to limit the state is used then to be li a license to expand state power. 
Well, I certainly would not oppose the appointment of a special prosecutor that is brought in from outside that jurisdiction whenever the cops kill a person, because I agree with you. The prosecutor is, is oftentimes working closely with the cops. It becomes buddies with them. He doesn't want to alienate them. He doesn't want them to get angry at him. If he goes after a cop and prosecutes him, there's going to be animosity there. So, yeah, you can't, you can't count on the local prosecutor to go after a cop. Uh, the best thing to do is to bring in the out-of-town prosecutor, let him handle the case. Uh, because you're right, if a prosecutor goes before a grand jury and doesn't present a forceful case and sort of is namby-pamby, he can signal uh, to the grand jury how he's feeling uh, one way or the other. And your point about the colonial era is really, really good. Because, I mean, every school kid in America is taught that the, that the, the, the smugglers that were avoiding the tea tax and the, the Stamp Act and so forth were great heroic people. And they really were heroic people. <laughs> but when they look at what people are doing today to avoid them, all of a sudden they look at them in the same way the British looked at the people that were avoiding the Stamp Act and the tea tax. And, and yeah, you're right. This is a, this is a prime example that Eric Garner was avoiding taxing, uh, taxes on cigarettes. He was selling cigarettes at a low price. His competitors in the stores that had licenses from the state to do this um, were there obviously upset that they've got this unfair competition. I mean, it really goes to show you how perverse things have become in this country, Shelton. I mean, every, everything's like topsy-turvy, upside down. And, and to me, it's a direct consequence of this enormous welfare warfare state apparatus. Uh, it had consequences. And uh, among those consequences are death and destruction and loss of liberty. And we see the death with Eric Garner for doing nothing more than raising his voice to the cops and selling untaxed single cigarettes. I mean, to me, that shows you the ultimate manifestation of the welfare warfare state. This, this militarized police force that says we can do whatever we want to do and nothing's going to happen to us. Anyway, that's our show. We're about out of time. Uh, I'm Jacob Hornberger, and this is Sheldon Richmond. And uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.